good evening everybody i think uh, again always a pleasure to be in this forum and um, as i have always been speaking i will speak only on the advances or the concepts that are slightly newish in salivary gland neoplasms um it's a very common topic everybody knows it i would at best be able to give you a very broad overview considering the comprehensiveness of this topic and as i said i would focus more on the recent advances and a real case examples you know some things that what we have managed over the years obviously i think i'll try to focus on parotid tumors because uh, there is less evidence when it comes to the management of other cancers the submandibular the sublingual and the minor salivary gland tumors nevertheless i will touch a little bit of the other tumors as well as always seen it is a very heterogeneous group of cancers in fact if you see the adenomas or say there are 13 distinct types of adenomas and 24 different types of carcinomas and the pathological classifications needs keeps changing so definitely apart from the surgical expertise which is the main focus of treatment for the salivary gland neoplasms you also need a very skilled cytopathologist and the pathologist for accurate diagnosis for these patients and it will guide the further management radiotherapy of course has been there for ages there are some advances in radiation therapy especially with the use of newer uh, advances in the radiotherapy technology and systemic therapies which was practically unheard of a few decades ago has come and we will try to briefly skim through the advances that has happening in these fields once you see the icd classification the major salivary glands that's the parotid the submandibular and the sublingual will actually are staged by the tnm staging the minor salivary glands however are staged as adenocarcinomas and they are staged based on the subsite in which they arise and as we know that they are about 700 to 800 in numbers and they can arise anywhere in the aerodigestive tract very quickly we'll go to a case scenario it's a 46 year old lady who had a 10 months history of cough and occasional hemoptysis at a ct chest you might be wondering why i am presenting the case but there is a link to this showed a 7 into 6 cm left hilar mass and a bronchoscopy biopsy showed a neoplasm epithelial neoplasm we did uh, i'm just cutting short the work up because there are a lot of other cases for us to present so during the course of this work up we did a pet ct scan for this lady and found a uh, 7 into 6 cm mass in the left lower lobe of course we proceeded to wet lower lobectomy for these patients and what we found is the histology came as a pulmonary mucoepidermoid carcinoma so the scope of salivary gland neoplasms not just is restricted to the major salivary glands the but the minor salivary glands and it can occur as i said anywhere in the aerodigestive tract and this is a classical example of the same an entity called as primary pulmonary salivary gland tumors which is a very distinct entity it's not something new but it is very rare and very, very distinct if you see just like the other major salivary gland tumors you have the adenoid cystic carcinomas the mucoepidermoid carcinomas and the epithelial myoepithelial carcinomas in that order again surgery is a predominant form of treatment there is hardly any role for any adjuvant treatment especially for the low grade ones of course with the growth of interventional pulmonology there is a scope for interventional pulmonological based debulking for these tumors or sometimes you can use it as a bridge to perform parenchymal sparing resections so of course the scope of salivary gland tumors as i said is very many and uh, we had actually explored this case based on the context like for example in an adenocarcinoma of the lung or in case of any other the neoplasms of the lung pet ct scan would be a standard evaluation but in a salivary gland tumors we probably possibly don't need to do a pet ct scan however there is a lot of literature pertaining to the role of pet ct scans in the evaluation of these mucoepidermoid carcinomas as well and there is some role that it is prognostic as well and this case was to just give you the glimpse of the scope of the salivary gland tumors now let's back come back to some of the core basics so in terms of the risk factors radiation is one of the most common risk factor and thus for thus was seen in the japanese survivors of the nuclear bomb it was not just thyroid cancers but there had an increase in the incidence of salivary gland tumors as well 
In the Senjut series also, among the childhood cancer survivors, what they found is there was an increased incidence of childhood cancers among the survivors as well. History of prior cancers is very important. So a lot of patients with presenting with salivary gland tumors may have some history of prior cancers, like for example, as I mentioned about the childhood cancers, and some of those cancers would be Hodgkin's, medulloblastomas, or any skin cancer. Practically any cancer in which an ultraviolet radiation exposure is there could have a predilection for a salivary gland tumor as well. Now what to do when it comes to the evaluation for these tumors? Again, I think this is something core basic. I don't really want to touch into the core basics, but then the fact remains that to put things into perspective, I may have to give a broad overview about this as well. The most common would be a painless swelling and pain is a, a symptom of advanced disease. Very uh, commonly in deep carotid tumors, you have parapharyngeal fullness or palatal fullness is there. And there is a thing that we have known for ages that the rate of malignant transformation or malignancy, rates of malignancy is inversely proportional to the size of the gland. So the larger the gland, like for example, the rooted gland, the lesser is the size of uh, the chance of malignancy. We know the 80% rule, 80% of the tumors uh, uh, arise in the parotid gland, 80% of them are benign and almost 80% of them are pleomorphic adenomas. There's, there is in fact again something called as a 40% rule and this is not something very new but it says that in 40% of the cases, especially in younger people less than 40 years, there would be an indolent progression of the tumors whereas in elderly people, especially more than 60 years, you have 40% of the tumors with an aggressive predilection. So there are certain rules, certain numbers, I think certain trainees may have some fascination, so it is the slide is exclusively for them. Signs of advanced disease, and this is something that every trainee should sort of keep in mind. Uh, intrinsic mobility, obviously, if there is a fixity to the underlying mandible or the overlying skin or facial nerve involvement or any lymph nodal involvement or distant metastasis involvement, we know that these are signs of advanced disease. Uh, coming to the next is the role of imaging. When I was training, a large school of thought actually said that there is no room for any imaging or any cytology for a superficial tumor, which is there in the parotid, or a mobile tumor rather, which is there in the parotid gland. And uh, you can directly take up the patient for superficial parotidectomy. And this was the classical teaching which was there. And I have gone through this as well. But of late, what we have found is there is an increasing role of ultrasound in the management of these tumors. We know that ultrasound in uh, the management of various head and neck tumors, including thyroid tumors, is there. And ultrasound is very less used in parotid tumors. And there is a large amount of data which is coming with regards to the use of ultrasound in these tumors. Ultrasound also has been used to sort of do the procedures of guided FNAC and guided core needle biopsies, a thing that I would allude to later. But by and large, when we speak about imaging for the salivary glands, we always talk of cross-sectional imaging. And I would like to say that 80% of the tumors are actually small. That is, they arise from the superficial lobe. They may be mobile. And you may not require cross-sectional imaging in these patients. A good clinical examination, a good ultrasound may suffice. And you can do a cytology, either blind or a guided cytology. It is only for the 20% of the tumors that are slightly larger or involve the deep lobe, wherein you need to see the extent in the parapharyngeal space, that you need some sort of cross-sectional imaging and MRI is preferred than CT scan. The PET CT scan, of course, has been mentioned as a part of the investigations, but it's used pretty rarely, or very, very sparingly used. Uh, it's mainly in the setting of recurrent tumors or more importantly in prior malignancies. I said that childhood survivors have some prior malignancies or very rarely you may have a prior malignancy. So if that is the scenario, only you would require a PET CT scan. Otherwise, more often than not, when it comes to the imaging in the small subset of larger tumors, we would prefer an MRI. Of course, there is some data on the role of PET CT scans that have said that it has changed the therapy in up to 15% of the patients. And this is there across the spectrum in various tumors. And there is also studies to say that PET CT scans could be prognostic, especially in the high grade tumors. Majority of the uh, salivary gland tumors are local. local. Some of them, about 15 to 20% of them would be local regional, but very rarely they could present with distant metastasis as well. Lungs being the more common site. 
and and it generally the higher grade the tumor that is as you, as you seen in salivary gland carcinomas high grade mucoepidermoid carcinomas carcinomas ex pleomorphic adenomas and this is an entity that has slightly changed and i will come to that in the later slides and squamous cell carcinomas quite rare in the salivary glands but still are reported it is only in these cancers salivary gland tumors that you have higher rate of distant metastasis at this point of time i would like to highlight that this is something which is a very known fact that pulmonary metastasis especially in the setting of adenoid cystic carcinoma tends to behave very indolent and there have been some cases in which you have up to 5 10 15 or even 20 years survivals also are there so the management scope of pulmonary metastasis in adenoid cystic carcinoma by itself is a topic but this is something i thought that i would highlight at this stage itself uh, interestingly there is some concept called as a metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma this is something it's been described in the literature pretty rare it's actually histologically it's a pleomorphic adenoma or a benign adenoma but you do find there is a local and distant metastasis as well and what really happens is it is preceded by multiple local recurrences after a long interval and you get this phenomenon called as a metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma and we have had to uh, we were lucky to manage a couple of these patients for example this was a 54 year old lady she had about our second recurrence when she presented to us i think in 2008 uh, of a pleomorphic adenoma of the submandibular gland and some astute radiologists in a chest x ray picked up that small lesion and then we did a ct scan and somebody smart enough interventional radiology plucked into that centimeter lesion and we got as a pleomorphic adenoma so in this lady we did surgery both for the submandibular gland lesion as well as the lung lesion and we found that the submandibular lesion had actually transformed to a myoepithelial carcinoma whereas the lung lesion remained benign so it's not uncommon to have a local pleomorphic adenoma having multiple recurrences spreading locally or at times being a pleomorphic adenoma but having spread so this concept of metastasizing pleomorphic adenoma and it is there uh, there is a concept of metastasizing leiomyomas as well so this is not a completely new concept but this is a concept that we would very rarely see and i would urge uh, trainees that whenever you find tumors that have multiple recurrences be very careful and see the chest imaging in these patients you may see some lesions and not all these patients are metastases you need not write off anybody because some of them would be benign and if you do surgery in this select group of benign metastasizing pleomorphic adenomas it is more than curative for these patients subsequently i think this is a very most important evaluation when it comes to the management of salivary gland neoplasms the fnac that's commonly used an office procedure the use is it could tell whether you are dealing with a salivary or a non salivary gland tumor you could it could give some idea whether it's inflammatory benign versus malignant grade and expert cytopathologist may be able to tell you a grade but find you it's, it's very very difficult for some ordinary cytopathologist to tell you a grade so there are these myriad uses of fnac in the evaluation of the salivary gland tumors of course we know the limitations of the fnac that there could be a lot of false negatives the sensitivity is low sometimes around 60s to 90% of course the specificity is high when it comes to especially tumors like warden's tumors and lymphomas fnac is notoriously insensitive and also in pleomorphic adenoma surprisingly a lot of times there is a confusion and even in low grade tumors like low grade uh mucoepidermoid carcinoma sometimes fnac may be a problem so you must understand although it it is a recommended investigation recommendation of choice in the evaluation of salivary gland tumors it does have certain limitations the other thing is the standardization of reporting and we have seen not just in ultrasound but in cytology across the sites in head and neck and probably various parts of the body there is a standardization of reporting and in case of salivary gland tumors you have this concept of a milan staging of salivary glands it is very similar to the bethesda staging for thyroid neoplasms divided into six stages of course there is a stage of non diagnostics if you don't have a real expert cytopathologist or if your yield is not good you may have a lot of non diagnostic or non uh, especially non diagnostic cytologies but the milan staging was proposed by a group of experts in 2017 published by rossi in 2018 and a lot many groups of 
uh, expert uh, surgeons who handle salivary gland malignancies, they have been sort of in their unit, I think they have been using the Milan criteria. So I think you can sort of reach out to your cytopathologist or your histopathologist to sort of you know, report the salivary glands in a standardized manner. And it helps in publications, it helps in comparisons of data as well. The other important thing is about the differential diagnosis, which could be a lot many. It could be cysts, which could be either pre or normal cysts, sometimes HIV also produces some sort of cysts, so there could be cysts related to some infections. It could be partial lymph node, and we know that the rotated gland itself, there are a lot of intraperotid lymph nodes are there. They could be enlarged, they could be uh, uh, involved in some malignant processes as well. You could have a lymphoma which is arising from one of the intraperotid nodes, or sometimes what happens is one of the lymph nodes may be involved in a squamous cell carcinoma as a process of metastatic. So you must learn to differentiate all these things and by and large i think that there is the inflammatory component which i'll come to in a little later and of course the more common tumors that we tend to manage and metastasis is also there and which is very interesting and i will present possibly a couple of cases to sort of you know drive home these points so again one another case scenario 18 year old lady presented to us a, with a painless left parotid swelling long duration recently increased was around five into four centimeters. If it's on diagnostic, did an MRI because it was a slightly largest tumor. Just a minute. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. And um, uh, this was uh, this some some issue on the internet. So that's the reason why. So we got a little bit slow. And it showed a very thick walled cyst and who oh, the histological or pathological surprise it turned out to be a branchial cleft cyst and uh, digging deeper into the literature what we found is a type one branchial first bronchial cleft cyst can mask under uh, masquerade as a parotid tumor and uh, digging into the anatomy more we know that you know some of these branchial cleft abnormalities cysts uh, fistula sinuses are there and you have a vast differential diagnosis for this but as surgeons the important thing of the clinical significance is that these cysts are often overlooked a lot of times they are mismanaged in fact we luckily sort of you know did the right treatment for these patients it was not diagnosed preoperatively a lot of times some of these cysts may get infected a lot of surgeons may tend to do a lot of incision and drainage procedures. So what they say is any young lady who has had a multiple incision and drainage procedures in the neck, you should suspect some abnormalities in this patient. Of course, the treatment of choice is surgery, but one needs to be shipped with the patient. And you may have certain inflammatory components as well. And the classic is no as uh, if you read the classical tech diseases like the Michaelis disease or the Michaelis syndrome, and this was something not new, it was described way back by uh, Dr. Michaelis. He was a student of Bill Roth. It was published as early as 1892 in a middle aged farmer, bilateral enlargement of the lacrimal and salivary glands. So, this is a classical inflammatory disease which people may encounter in their general surgical practice. In fact, Michaelis at that particular time concluded that the nature of the disease itself was a big mystery. We also had one more very interesting uh, patient who presented to us in 2011. As you see, bilateral enlargement of the lacrimal glands and enlargement of the bilateral parotid glands as well. We did a coronal biopsy and mind you, this is a coronal biopsy. And we got what is a diagnosis of a mantle cell lymphoma. So now we know that a lot of these Michaelis disease and syndromes are actually possibly a, a manifestation of a mantle cell lymphoma. The patient was started rightly on a combination chemotherapy. Let's not go into too much of the details. But then you see the dramatic recovery that happened in this patient. When this gentleman walked into the OPD and greeted me, I, was, well, I couldn't recognize him having seen him in, in a very different state. And, but he did a dramatic recovery and he went on, he's still following up with us. So, so you do get some of the inflammatory, but actually turning out to be 
lymphoma and a lot of these patients you will have to do a core needle biopsy so never do a core needle biopsy in a peritoneal and even now I'm, I'm thinking you'll have to be really careful in your examinations. Ultrasound, when it comes to the salivary glands, it's on the ultrasound guided core needle biopsy, and the core of these is much lesser than the traditional core needle biopsies. There have been a couple of case reports of, of uh, tumor seedling, but then there is a large meta analysis uh, which says that it is pretty sensitive and specificity in terms of more than 95% and much more than the FNAC, but it has to be used selectively and under ultrasound guidance. In a large series, we could have some amount of hematomas, one temporary palsy, but no tumor seeding at all. So it's pretty safe in case you suspect an inflammatory process or in case you suspect a lymphoma, I think you and in case your FNACs are not representative, you may go for a core needle biopsy very selectively ultrasound guided in these patients. There is some also... Uh, of eroded gland metastasis and whenever we are dealing with a cutaneous malignancies in the head and neck, be it a cell cards from the eroded nodes become the first so you must be very careful and have some eroded gland or eroded node involvement in these non-cutaneous sites also have about 10 to 15 percent and very rarely you may have an infra eroded primary as well Um, again, when it comes to the incidence of intra parotid primaries, um, then you more common is there in the breast, prostate, and the GI tract. Treatment again, two very interesting cases: a 60-year-old lady, uh, earlier treated for breast cancer, luminal A, seven years back, came with a right neck mass, upper neck mass, six months duration. FNAC was a poorly differentiated carcinoma. Cutting the history short, we went on to evaluate the CT. And mind you, I said that somebody has a staging evaluation, not just for this cancer, but also for the earlier cancer itself. We could find uh, 6 to 5 to 4 centimeters in the parapharyngeal space, as seen in these pictures of the PET CT in this actual view. It's much clearly seen also in this profile view as well. Um, then uh, we actually, it was a solitary site of metastasis. So we approached this, I think, parapharyngeal space tumors. Uh, I would come to that a little later, how you approach the parapharyngeal space. We, in this patient, did a trans-cervical, trans approach and completely removed these particular tumor. And it came out as a metastasis from a breast cancer. So this patient, we gave her second line hormonal therapy and she went on to live for many years. So sometimes you could get uh, uh, a lot of metastasis and this is there in the deep lobe or in the region of the deep lobe of the parotid or the parapharyngeal space. Again, we had an interesting, another patient of a rectal carcinoma presenting with a parotid lesion, isolated site. We did a parotid, uh, parotidectomy for this patient but however, this gentleman progressed within six months despite second line therapy. I must admit that we didn't give the patient monoclonals or any aggressive therapies. So I present you two scenarios of breast cancer, probably luminal A, biologically quite indolent, metastatectin, the patient did very well. Vis a vis, this, gen this gentleman, a parotid gland metastasis from a rectal carcinoma. He progressed and we had another couple of cases also, not parotid, but other metastasis from rectal cancer other than lung in which the, uh, the progression happened very quickly. So one has to be very selective about the choice of metastatectomy for these patients. The other aspect is the advanced understanding, at least for the pathology. Of course, this is uh, more important from the pathologist's perspective, but it is very important for us to understand this. The WHO recently came up with a classification called the WHO classification that came up in 2017, published in early 2018. And there are many terminologies. I don't really want to go into a lot of the terminologies, but the terminology that has interested a lot of us is the terminology of secretory carcinomas. It was formerly called as a mammary analog secretory carcinomas, akin to the secretory carcinomas of the breast. And I think uh, we have abundant literature now of secretory carcinomas that it occurs in a more common. 
What is important in these cancers is if you ask your cytopathologist or your pathologist to go back and review the slides, a lot of the earlier cancers or secretory cancers would actually be reclassified as secretory cancers. So some of the cancers which were classified as muc epidermoid carcinomas in the new class, newer classification, they could be reclassified as secretory. So there is a distinct entity, and I think it's very important for your pathologists to learn, understand it, because the treatment implications are different. Secretory carcinomas are very, very indolent, and they have a very, very favorable prognosis. The other important changes in the WHO classification can, has been with, it, with neuroendocrine tumors, and this is applicable all across the body, and including the parotid glands, and also the fact that what, is, what we commonly know as carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, it has to be reported. You cannot stop short. The pathologist cannot stop short of reporting just that much. You'll have to tell whether it's a high-grade salivary duct carcinoma or a low-grade myopathy. So, so only a, merely a diagnosis of a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma in the present age won't suffice. The pathologist has to additionally tell whether it's a high-grade or low-grade, whether it's a salivary duct or a myoepithelial, because the treatment might change and the prognosis definitely changes. And there is an absolutely newer classification of thyeloblastomas. Grading, as I said, is very important. It's very important in terms of implications of treatment are there, which I'll come to a little later. Prognostically, we know that higher the grade, poorer the prognosis. There was a new grading system that was introduced by Wheat from the Netherlands in 2015. Lot, some of the cancers can have a high-grade transformation as well. And we know that it has uh, implications in its treatment and prognosis. Chromosomal rearrangement is very important for us to understand this because in cases of like hyalinizing carcinomas, that EWSR1 fusion would actually be diagnostic. So if this fusion is, is present, then it could diagnose this cancer. In low-grade mucopidermide carcinomas, presence of this MALM2 fusion protein actually says it's a better prognosis. And in case of adenoid cystic carcinomas, the presence of the MYB and NFIB gene fusion actually is being targeted. So a lot of these chromosomal rearrangements have been there across, and I've just given you a glimpse of the three more common uh, things that have actually impacted on the diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of the salivary gland tumors. Now, coming to the management studies, I, I knew it was a lot of uh, uh, pathology and cytology, but it's very important for us to know about these things because I'm sure that you know all these things which have will have an implication on the treatment approach, how we go about whether we do. Uh, to a total parotidectomy, whether we do a lymph node dissection or not. So all these things will have an implication. So it's, you can't really write it off and say that I don't really need this information. It's mandatory that you have a lot more of the information, especially when it comes to the grade and when it comes to an actual diagnosis, you'll be able to sort of treat your patients or manage your patients better. Uh, the principles of surgery has not changed, so I will not be going into the details of how you identify the facial nerve, and I'm sure a lot of us have done so many, uh, say, parotid surgeries or even other salivary gland surgeries. So this is something that I, I would leave it for somebody else to cover. My topic is just to cover the more recent advances in, which is happening. And in terms of superficial parotidectomy, which was there, people said that it is a minimum procedure for parotid neoplasms. In fact, some of that is changing right now. And that is something that I'm going to highlight because trainees, if they read a lot of textbooks of the extent of parotid surgery, might be surprised that you have two, three entities which have come up more than that. Initially, when we were training, we really had these three terminologies, superficial, total conservative, radical, and extended radical. Enucleation is something that was condemned for benign, malignant, even then it continues to be condemned. So there is absolutely no role of any open biopsy or enucleation for any of the parotid tumors. And uh, people assumed previously that if there is a malignancy, you always had to do a total conservative parotidectomy. A superficial parotidectomy is something that you should not do in the presence of a malignancy, and that concept has changed. In case the tumors are small, restricted to the superficial lobe, if they are non-high-grade tumors, without any lymph node metastasis, you can very safely do a superficial parotidectomy as long as your margin are good. So this is the newer concept. You have certain other terminologies and most of the other terminologies like just a minute. Yeah. Uh, most of the other terminologies like partial parotidectomy, 
you have something called an extra capsular peritonectomy or something called as adequate peritonectomy so if an astute learner goes into the textbooks you will find all these things in fact abundant data on partial peritonectomy i would want to caution everybody that these terminologies are not standardized i think they keep changing and evolving and they are applicable only for the benign lesions like pleomorphic adenomas more than 80% constitute pleomorphic adenomas and these should never be used in cases of a suspected malignancy or a frank malignancies but in case of pleomorphic adenomas of course you do have a lot of changes in terms of incision like for example we use the modified blair incision traditionally for malignancies but in in cases of pleomorphic adenomas they want to go for slightly different incisions like the rightidectomy incision or the facelift incision so in case of benign when we know that it is a benign then they try to be a little more conservative in terms of the extent of surgery and that's the reason why you have all terminologies like the partial the extra capsular and the adequate peritonectomies in fact there is a very latest meta analysis earlier this year by lee et al saying that a partial peritonectomy for a pleomorphic adenoma is actually recommended so i think one has to be one has to take all these things with a pinch of salt i must say that these are only for very very smaller tumors but for the conventional tumors that we see more than a, a couple of centimeters and especially if they are in the middle of the peritoneum it is safer to do a superficial peritonectomy so only when some lesions are there which are about a centimeter or less which are there especially in the lower pole can you think about doing lesser than a superficial peritonectomy otherwise i think you are good to do a superficial peritonectomy be it benign or malignant again we i just briefly spoke to you all about the parapharyngeal tumors in one of the cases that we had presented some of the deep lobe tumors of the parotid present as parapharyngeal tumors about 80% of the parapharyngeal tumors are benign 20% would be malignant more common is a neurogenic deep lobe parotid tumors are also very common and the approaches are far many it's it's a very complicated topic how you approach in fact as i said in the in the case in scenario i had mentioned that we accessed it by a transcranial approach you have also the transzygomatic you have the transmaxillary you also have the combined approaches your mandibulotomy approaches are also there and anybody who is really interested can actually see in one of our publications we had actually mentioned this this of course the publication was in 2014 but the concepts are pretty much the same it's relevant even today exploring the right approach was one of the title of our publication and it talks about all the six approaches when which approach you should do when especially when it comes to accessing the parapharyngeal space tumors in the interest of time i will probably skip and go ahead of course uh, there are some extended parotid resections that can actually be done in some of uh, the patients like for example i will show you a case scenario a 25 year old lady right parotid tumor since 1993 believe me this is a very very interesting case she had had three recurrences she came in 2005 to a surgeon they said inoperable nothing to be done she presented to us in 2010 like this a 15 cm lesion with the skin which is macerated and ulcerated and was oozing some uh, discharge and uh, when we slowly studied the ct scan we actually noted of course it was a very 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 large tumor vis-a-vis the comparison of the other structures in the head and neck but fortunately we could find the plane we found that it was not infiltrating any of the major vessels per se so we did a very extended resection for this lady and to our surprise it came as a polymorphous low grade adenocarcinoma it's a distinct entity the plgas are a very distinctive entities of uh, of tumors we did of course a uh, 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 free flap reconstruction for this lady uh, and you have the skull base approach sometimes like for example this gentleman he had a swelling in the parapharyngeal space again it was it was not an epithelial neoplasm it was a chondrosarcoma but then we did a skull base resection for this patient and uh, we had to so the extended resections are also a domain in which very rarely especially the adenoid cystic carcinomas which has a predilection of perineural spread sometimes you could chase it and you could sort of you know take up these extended resections in a very very selected cohort of these patients again uh, that much was for extent of resection for neck dissection i think there is more controversy here Uh, the major controversy is because of the fact that the rate of occult metastasis from a primary neoplasm is around 14 to 15 percent, and this is much less than the traditional squamous cell carcinomas, wherein the incidence sometimes in a 
slightly larger tumor becomes more than 20% an elective neck dissection. That's the why you have the controversy of whether to do a prophylactic neck dissection or not. And sometimes a lot of many people tend to sort of you know reserve the neck dissections for the advanced tumors. That's why if you have a higher stage tumor or a high grade tumor, you could do a selective neck dissection for some of these patients. Definitely when there is an N plus disease, you would do a comprehensive neck dissection, but you would spare the level 1A. Uh, you would you remove all other areas, but sparingly you would not do a neck dissection otherwise if the tumor was slightly lesser staged and non-high grade tumor. There is a lot of concept of facial nerve monitoring, intraoperative nerve monitors are there. It's a very attractive option. If you see the evidence, and this was a meta-analysis by Goel, uh, it was in 2018, what they said, definitely there is a decreased incidence of uh, temporary uh, paralysis for these patients, but it didn't really matter in terms of the final outcome. So the surgical principles, especially if you are practicing in the community, doesn't really change. You just need to be very, very meticulous two instruments that I, I was told I was taught in my MS Gen surgery days. You use a six inch Kelly and you use your bipolar. If you have these two instruments, you are really good because you do have uh, nowadays a lot of other instruments like the hormonic scalpel. Some of the people are used to using loops or microvascular loops for these so better visualization. But I think it's just that um, you'll have to be familiar or comfortable with whatever, like, you know, even without any loop, even without a fancy technology-based energy equipment, with a regular six-inch Kelly and a bipolar. And in fact, that's what that's how I was trained. And even now, given a choice, I would possibly sort of do a parotidectomy even with with that uh, those many instruments. So there is no reason why you should sort of you know feel that you are not having a facial nerve monitor. But definitely, in case of recurrent cases, uh, facial nerve monitoring definitely would be useful for some of these patients. Coming to adjuvant radiation therapy, there's a very little change that has happened over the years. A, a, a more multiple nodes, T3, T4 tumors, high grade, and this is pretty common. I think uh, this didn't radically change ever since I've trained. Any high grade R1 or R2 resections, LVI, PNI, or a recurrent tumor, you would add radiation therapy. But what has changed is the concept of giving chemotherapy to some of these patients. And uh, the evidence is not much. <clears throat> the evidence has been largely extrapolated from the squamous cell carcinomas. And the RTOG1008 trial, in fact, a part of this trial was actually recently published, in, uh, recently presented, sorry, in an abstract form in the ASCO uh, uh, earlier th uh, this month. And uh, we have uh, some retrospective data that it this gave a better local control than radiation therapy, but we don't really have the full results of the RTOG 1008 trial. So very selectively, when you have adverse characteristics, high grade, multiple nodes, extra nodal, you may consider to add chemotherapy to some of these patients. Again, I think there are a huge set of complications of parotid. I didn't, in the interest of time, I didn't really want to go into this. We can discuss some of them if you want. The more important thing, as I said, is the facial nerve and uh, more important that you will have to really be diligent and preserve it. Uh, of course, if you follow up all these patients, a lot of them would have recurrences and there is a selective role of metastatectomy. I showed a couple of cases in which we have done metastatectomies. We've also done some metastatectomies for adenoid cystic carcinomas as well. There is some role for uh, radiation and re-radiation as well in some of these patients. Uh, 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 some role of chemotherapy I spoke to in the adjoint sitting, but as I said, in a lot of other salivary duct carcinomas, some of them uh, express androgen receptors. So the treatment that we have used for uh, prostate cancers like the uh, flutamide, bicalatamide, sometimes can be used in androgen expressing advanced salivary duct carcinomas. Some of the salivary gland tumors also express uh, HER2 which is there in breast cancers and advanced G-junction adenocarcinomas as well. So if HER2 expression is there in some of the advanced cancers, uh, Herceptin or Rastuzumab has been tried with modest successes. Uh, Brontexumab is a monoclonal antibody targeting notch 1. And this is one very good target uh, biomarker in cases of adenoid cystic carcinomas. And as in, in many other cancers, you have a lot of data of checkpoint inhibitors as well. A lot of checkpoint inhibitors has come in the management of 
a very big life changer. So I think I would end my topic here. I would sort of I thought like I I didn't really want to sort of so present the regular run, run of the mill. I thought I would give some interesting examples of different sorts of, sorts of scenarios. I know this is just a broad overview. This by no means is uh, sort of comprehensive. This is what I can do justice in an hour or something like that. But I'm sure there are a lot of things that I've uh, sort of uh, not covered. But I think a lot of things has been sparingly covered, if not not covered. And I'm sure that if there are any questions, comments or anything, I think we can sort of now see and discuss and uh, we have an abundant time. I think Dr. Pata has been very kind in, with regards to time to us and I think we have abundant time. So any questions are there, uh, we would, I would be very happy to sort of uh, answer them. And I would like to thank Dr. Pata again for the opportunity. It's been a real pleasure for me to sort of pull out a lot of our own data which we have accumulated over a couple of decades and present them to you all in a slight fashion, integrating the advances that have happened over the years. Thank you once again. Sir. Thanks, Arvin. Uh, Dr. Srinivasan, you want to make a comment, sir? No, I'd like, I would like to ask, uh, what is siloblastoma is it? You had mentioned one word, siloblastoma. Yeah, yeah, yes. oh, it, it is a type of uh, salivary gland neoplasm. It's a newer uh, entity. There is a characteristic uh, uh, finding. It is more from the pathologist's perspective. If you see the WHO classification, sir, I think uh, what has happened is in 2017, they came up with a newer classification. This is a benign entity. And by and large, I think uh, they are all, some of these tumors have a very indolent course, a, a good prognosis, and surgery is the treatment option. There are certain telltale characteristic features of this tumor, but by and large, it is an uh, extended spectrum of the parotid tumors. What is the treatment you give us? Surgery. Superficial. Yeah, superficial. It is, it is, it is a, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is a benign tumor. Mm. Yes, sir. It is a benign tumor. Benign tumor is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is a. It comes under the spectrum of a benign tumor, and mm. the treatment, by and large, the treatment for mm. most of the parotid things have not changed much. So, much. except in case of uh, high-grade tumors, or you know, much uh, only then we add tend to add to the extent of the surgery, the extent of lymph node dissection. But by and large, I think the. The things, the changes have come in the cytology and in the classification of these tumors. So what are the, which are the tumors which metastasis to the skull? No, as I said, sir, I think um, there are um, metastasis. Any particular tumor, like uh, certain tumors got a perineural spread, certain uh, malignant tumors which metastasis to skull. Like, uh, as I said, I, I will go back to the slide. There are certain tumors like, uh, by and large, parotid gland tumors present in, in a local regional fashion. Some of them do have distant metastasis. More commonly is the lungs and the, the second most site is the bone. And it is only the high-grade tumors, the high-grade mucoepidermoid tumors, some of the squamous cell carcinomas, some of the high-grade or the adenoid cystic carcinomas that have had a high-grade transformation those are the tumors that would sort of, you know, has a tendency to metastasize. But otherwise, I think uh, by and large, uh, it is, uh, and the salivary duct carcinomas as well. But by and large, if the, any other spectrum of tumors, they don't really present with that much of metastasis. Which part of the skull does it go in metastasis, if it goes? Any idea? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, Par se, the case reports, uh, no, there, are, there are two aspects of this, sir. Uh, metastasis would, whether it is actual uh, metastasis or extension of parapharyngeal, because sometimes what happens is some of the uh, deep low parotid tumors, they actually go into the parapharyngeal space. And from the parapharyngeal space, they can actually go into the base skull itself. So along the nerve. So to one, one, it is very important for us to differentiate whether some of these tumors are actually a local spread of these tumors. And some of them, especially the adenoid cystic carcinomas, which you said has a predilection for neural, very neural spread, they could have something called a skip metastasis as well. So it's very important for us to sort of see the course of the facial nerve in these patients and try to sort of get a negative margin in, in, in a frozen section. So very rarely you could use a frozen very section. Very rarely. So one final question, as, a, as an examiner, if the PG says if there's a skull metastasis, is it operable or inoperable, sir? 
in a in a salivary gland tumor i would not say that it's no you'll have to as i said sir i think um, metastatectomies per se I, in fact uh, I, in fact we have abundant data of doctor in fact i was suggesting to dr patta that you know we have a, a lot of metastatectomy data available with us majority of that is for pulmonary metastasis pulmonary and, metastasis and yes, and sir. we have we have certain criteria for metastatectomy that is that the primary tumor has to be controlled or controllable and yes, especially you, you must have a long disease free interval preferably yes, between 2 to 3 years or more yes, and sir. the the pulmonary metastasis should be amenable for a curative resection and you have to have an r0 resection that is a complete resection yes, and sir. the patient should not have any overriding mor- morbidity or mortality obviously because of these procedures so you, we have certain four or five criteria and yes, if sir. the person fits most of these criteria we would do and this criteria is largely applicable for pulmonary metastasis which is more common in a salivary gland tumors some of the bony metastasis as you mentioned the skull metastasis they may not actually fit into and even we have done some metastasis and the other thing is the metastasis preferably if it's a solitary metastasis it is also something that has been slightly good but as i said even we've had many other cancers of of isolated soft tissue metastasis but unfortunately although they may be amenable if you are cl- carefully selecting them for metastatectomy some of them like the rectal cancer case i showed they even with second line chemotherapy they tend to progress so one must be very careful in <clears throat> trying to select these patients thank you sir i am dr srinivasan professor of surgery coimbatore medical college coimbatore sir <laughs> i'd like to introduce myself <laughs> thank you sir nice you seeing thank you sir your questions were really sort of stimulating Thank because you. uh, uh post gadget uh, uh, pattern of thing uh, i I'll, i'll keep in i'll keep in touch with you sir i'll get the number from professor radha krishnan professor radha krishnan sir thank you very much yeah uh, pleasure sir dr <laughs> ishwar you, you wanted to say something uh, uh, sir you mentioned about the uh, extra capsular uh, dissection right right uh, could it be similar like an enucleation uh, <laughs> different <laughs> no i mentioned that because uh, some of these terminologies are mentioned in the textbooks and uh, most of these dissections have been yes, used still for, even uh, yeah yeah most of these terminologies have been used for benign, benign disease. disease and they have been used by yes. certain experts and what they do is they tend to sort yes, of you know so the basic premise of this adequate periodontectomy partial periodontectomy or extra capsula is instead of removing the entire superficial lobe what they tend to do is they tend to remove the tumor with a cuff of normal parietal tissue sometimes they don't visualize the facial nerve okay. also so those are very, so those are very okay. tricky operations it has to be done by, by real experts and we would not recommend something of that sort a more large bit of, of our tumors are slightly bigger so i think uh, uh, superficial periodontectomy yes. still i think continues still to remain the gold standards and these have been mentioned in textbooks the problem is if we don't talk about them i think uh, the message will go wrong so it's better that you know people know that these terminologies are there but it is very important for them to know when to sort of you know use uh, use this as a modality of treatment for some of these benign conditions Okay, Dr. Karthik, so when you are planning to preserve the cell, uh, sir, when you are when you are planning to preserve the facial nerve, yes, sir, in in, in presence of human malignancies, and which are the histological criteria you do consider in such cases? Per uh, se, there is no special consideration for histological criteria. Um, yes, the mo- the most important aspect that we see is the preoperative functioning of the nerve. If the nerve is preoperative functioning, whatever the history, even if it's an adenoid cystic carcinoma, we sort of you know try to very very hard to sort of preserve the nerve. It is preoperative functioning. Sometimes the what happens is preoperative it functions and intraoperatively we find that it is it is slightly engulfed or you know very close proximity. So at that times, those are the times when loops actually help. They sort of you know yes. we can actually spend a lot of time and sort of try to tease out that nerve. and try to sort of you know get uh, get a good margin from from these patients but per se i think uh, based on any histology we don't really and we are very very careful because a lot of studies have have said that unnecessary previously what used to happen was uh, 
some some people used to sort of you know whenever there was a deep lobe tumor they did a radical peritonectomy and this is something which is a practice that has to be condemned so whenever the facial nerve is intact pre operatively and intraoperatively you will be able to tease it out it is our duty rather to yes. sort of you know present the nerve because it oncologically it sacrificing such a near functioning nerve makes absolutely no sense Okay. That it doesn't add anything. Survival of the recurrence doesn't doesn't Not, have any impact. Any. No, no, no impact at all, sir. And that's the yeah. reason why I think it is the duty of our sir, of us as surgeons to sort of yes, you sir. know take the tumor out and preserve the nerve and it's anatomically. So we we preserve the anatomical integrity of the nerve. And sometimes if you have a face uh, intraoperative nerve monitoring at the end of the surgery, you could sort of you know stimulate and you could see an EMG signal and you could sort yes. of you know. Actually, sort of say that oh yeah, I have preserved the nerve. Then eighty percent of the paraffin tubes again are the benign. There is again. Can you have others? Do that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, Next. sir. Okay. Dr. Karthik. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening, Karthik. Uh, sir, uh, in case of uh, uh, radiotherapy for recurrence, if you have done a R zero resection, when will we consider radiation? So it is same as the after primary or. any recurrence will consider radiation or only for high grades so uh, again the traditional teaching is if it's a recurrent tumor then you consider sort, sort of a radiation therapy if it was not given earlier so that is the concept uh, naj concept behind this and this actually doesn't apply to sort of you know if somebody has done an incomplete surgery like an incisional biopsy then you do it then you should not consider it as a recurrence so you have to be very important to classify what it is like so by and large i think the indications have been pretty much standardized and if if a tumor has been operated and there's a long dfi it comes as a recurrence then you may consider definitely radiation therapy for these patients even if it's a low grade sir the, and you, uh, if the, in some low grades you also have to see whether there is other factors like for example if there is a perineural invasion or if there is a tumor spillage some of the guidelines actually recommend radiation therapy but uh, very rare to have a low grade recurrence unless you have spilled the tumor so that means if a low grade tumor is recurring that means the primary surgeon who has handled them would have had a tumor spill so that is the logic of having the recurrence and radiating them so if you see the carefully some of the guidelines what they say even if tumors are low grade if there is a tumor spill or if there is a perineural invasion you still give radiation for these patients and this is just an extrapolation of the same concept so uh, there is no again there is no very hard and fast evidence for answering your question but this is an extrapolation of the logic that we tend to use in a particular clinical scenario sir uh, one last question in case of a unresectable primary or a local recurrence is there any evidence to support uh, systemic therapy to down stage to favor surgery uh, no 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 nothing i, I think uh, by and large systemic therapies have been tried only in the metastatic setting and not as a new it has not come uh, as a pretty standard but having said that in some of these tumors i think radiation therapy and especially Uh, especially in adenoid cystic carcinoma you have the neutron but of course it's not available you uh, some sometimes the proton beams are there sometimes the carbon ion therapies are there so they they tend to sort of give some uh, tend, uh, advantage to these tumors so one of the indications for radiation therapy uh, as a definitive modality sorry is in cases of inoperable tumors so you could definitely consider radiation therapy as a modality of these tumors and then subsequently Uh, you have the tumor and you have any of these uh, bizarre mutations then you could possibly target them with them but definitely systemic therapy not as a primary modality to down stage we don't really have much evidence at this point of time thank you sir ashok kumar dr ashok kumar you have a question <coughs> Arvind, there are some uh, queries in the chat box. If you can look up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just looking at that, sir. Do you remove the whole tract as well as the cyst? I don't know. I think maybe it was for the. Uh, yeah. Uh, generally, a cyst does not have per se. This is not like a thyroglossal cyst or something like this. It is a branchial cyst, and I think you would have to do an in toto excision. And I said, like in terms of maybe the question was in relation to the branchial cyst, the first branchial cleft cyst. 
in such a scenario one has to be very careful about the facial nerve work. because sometimes what happens is the cyst tends to sort of you know displace the facial nerve in a much bizarre way than than a tumor actually does so there have been a lot of variations are because of the presence of the cyst so one has to be really very careful while operating for some of these bronchial cysts extent of parotidectomy for intra parotid node metastasis i think that's a very 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 tricky question uh, generally what they say is that um, uh, if there is an intra parotid node extension then you there is an indication to do a total conservative parotidectomy so but um, what really happens is that you know you must sort of in individualize some of these patients if they if the tumors tend to be high grade if there is obviously some uh, neck nodal metastasis then these are certain things that you would sort of immediately tend to sort of uh, observe but intra parotid metastasis per se is very difficult to pick intraoperatively unless you are sending the uh, specimen for a further section examination so to answer your question short i think the iphone user uh, i think it's it's actually that you know it's an indication to do a total conservative parotidectomy as long as the facial nerve is intact lavanya asked uh, for size lesions do we go for metastatectomy uh, i think as i said a lot of uh, interest in metastatectomy per se i think there is no sort of uh, size cut off criteria i told the criteria i think uh, the metastasis should be resectable and uh, if you are able to get an r0 re resection then that that should be good enough so as i said that the primary again i repeat primary should be controlled or controllable long dfi Uh, preferably uh, all the metastasis should be encompassed should be a, and an r0 resection should be got and the patient should not have any functional morbidity or mortality because of this so i think if it fits this criteria i think any metastatectomy and especially in the pulmonary metastatectomy in fact we have abundant data of pulmonary metastatectomy i had stated that you know, i would sort of discuss some of our data on pulmonary metastatectomy probably possibly at a later point of time but to answer your question short uh, there's no size criteria as long as you're able to get a uh, good resection and the obviously the patient has a good functional reserve to tolerate that particular procedure you can see la in so what are the specific indications of technetium therapy for wardens tumors i think as the wardens tumor is uh, <clears throat> is a sort of uh, what really happens in wardens tumor i would probably answer it in in the other way that a preoperative diagnosis of a wardens tumor is, is very difficult a lot of uh, uh, false negatives actually happen in the diagnosis of the wardens tumor it's a very very difficult uh, tumor to diagnose a lot of times you sort of you know uh, tend to sort of you know uh, get the diagnosis on a final histology of course there are certain telltale signs you might be knowing like certain characteristics of wardens sometimes some of them will be bilateral some of them will be large cystic um some of them is common in smokers you could use technetium permanent night scan but by and large what really happens is that you know you don't tend to sort of you know get the diagnosis per se in fact there is an earlier school of thought that says that you know you don't really need to sort of operate on a wardens tumor considering that it doesn't really do much for these patients so it is a diagnosis of uh, it's a very difficult diagnosis to for a cytopathologist to sort of do and your treatments could be varied from no intervention to a minimal intervention so per se if you are not able to diagnose this preoperatively i think the question of scans may be a very very little it will be little far fetched for some of these patients so dharmara says outside operated case with final showing margin positivity tumor of yeah, yeah i think this is a, i think this is a very common problem uh, what really happens is that inadvertently somebody would have done and um, uh, a period, uh, either an enucleation or an incisional biopsy and uh, the problem only comes if it is um, if it's a low grade tumor so i think that is that is where the problem is come so the the issues here are that you know what we tend to do is we tend to sort of you know we are we don't we are, one thing that we must understand is we, we must know what are the timelines that is when would the excision was done and when the patient had come so it is very important that if supposing you are contemplating re surgery for whatever reasons uh, be an inadequate primary surgery don't rush and do the surgery immediately wait for some more time because a lot of times the inflammatory component is there it it, it needs to subside even if it is a low grade tumor so you 
allow the inflammatory component to subside, allow for a couple of weeks, re-examine the patient once the inflammation is done, then you try to do an MRI for these patients and then take the call and, uh, and then you go for a surgery. So it's very important that we wait for the inflammation to subside. Clinically, you, you tend to assess these patients better. Radiologically, I think some of the radiologists will find it better to assess these tumors, especially if uh, time has lapsed. And then we'll be able to sort of manage these patients better. And as I said, if there's any incomplete thing, then you'll have to go, go and do surgery. But the only other technical challenge in these patients is that, you know, we'll have to be very careful because the incidence of uh, facial nerve, uh, uh, <clears throat> the sense getting uh, paresis is pretty high. And that is one of the indications in which we tend to use uh, uh, an indication, uh, rather, if you could use a nerve monitor in these patients. YouTube link, I think that is all in Dr. Pata's hands, I think. <laughs> so that you will sort of pick it up. Ashok Kumar, what is your question? Sir, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so I have two small questions. Number one, is there any role of core needle biopsy as of now? Number one. Number two, is there anything or any surgery in, uh, with the name suprafacial uh, dissection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, two very important questions you have raised, actually. Core needle biopsy, I did mention. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I reiterate that, you know, when we were training, then they said that even uh, sometimes even FNAC, they said don't do. Now we know that FNAC is an office procedure. It is pretty safe. Core needle biopsy is two important indications. That is, some people do it if repeated FNACs are coming negative. The, and the other important thing is, if you are suspecting a a difference in inflammatory pathology or a pathology in which you are not planning to give treatment in a surgical manner. For example, if, if you are suspecting a lymphoma, as in this case scenario that I showed, or if you are suspecting some inflammatory pathology and your FNACs are coming sort of negative, then you could possibly consider a core needle. And, I, and here, the core needle is, is not the regular cores that we know. It's, it's like an ultrasound guided core biopsies. And the bore of the needle is slightly very smaller and very thinner. So it's, it's actually like a gun in which you sort of do it under ultrasound guidance in a very, very controlled fashion. Of course, despite that, in the meta-analysis that was published by Lee earlier this year, you had about seven, uh, seven cases of hematoma, one case of temporary facial nerve paresis, but you had no tumor ceilings. So in a very, very small subset of patients, and you have also a lot of meta-analysis, as I said, to say... A lot of centers actually tend to do more core needle biopsies than FNACs. But beware of this when you are sort of, you know, speaking in the examination, because a lot of the senior examiners would sort of, you know, insist that you stick to FNAC. And I would sort of recommend that you stick to it unless and until you have one of these bizarre scenarios in which, or sometimes wherein it's an inoperable case, the, uh, it, then you just do a core needle biopsy for the diagnosis. Sometimes, as I said, in metastasis, we had in a couple of cases, you could do a core needle biopsy. So that is the where the regions we, we do core needle biopsies. And coming to the other, uh, there are very many terminologies, like, you know, as there was, somebody was also mentioning suprafacial, extrafacial, a lot of things are there. But by and large, I think all these terminologies, there is no standard classification. I've also sort of, you know, I've tried to search through a lot of literature. There's absolutely no standard classifications of the extent of periotidectomy. Somebody says levels of periotidectomy. So if you dwell into, it is very, very thick. So by and large, I think the whatever was there earlier, superficial, total conservative radical and extended radical stands good. The reason why a lot of these have come is because 80% of them are pleomorphic adenomas and uh, uh, which, which have a pre pretty benign course. So they are exploring means in which if we could do something less. And as I said, a lot of these have shown that your incidence of Ray syndrome, your incidence of pheresis is much, much less when you do slightly lesser. So that is the caveat. And that is why people tend to sort of you know, do uh, lesser, uh, lesser procedures for benign tumors. And I think this, there is hardly any standardization with these approaches. One has to be very selective about choosing one of these lesser approaches than a superficial periodectomy. But having said that, there is abundant literature available to say that partial periodectomy, in fact, the other adequate extra capsular or superficial, suprafacial and all those things, extra, we don't have much evidence. A lot of evidence is there for partial periodectomy. Partial periodectomy is when you sort of, you know, remove the tumor along with a cuff of normal tissue and the largest meta-analysis is there for partial periodectomy. So if at all you have a small benign uh, tumor like a pleomorphic adenoma, preferably in the tail of the gland, 
you may do one of these procedures but otherwise even if it's a larger pleomorphic adenoma i would say go ahead and do a superficial parotidectomy you are safe uh, and uh, you know, and your chances of tumor spillage recurrences are very very less thank you very much sir what uh, i have another question sir uh, yeah, go uh, ahead. this for the pg students who are, whoever else here in Sure, so sure, what, sure. What, what, what is your method of identifying the facial nerve? Facial nerve? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't uh, I actually tend to use one method. Of course, uh, it's a combination of various methods. But the two important things what I tend to use is the, of course, the first, I actually go to the tail parotid. I, I lift the tail parotid off. I try to carefully preserve the posterior branch of the greater auricular nerve. And this, I think, is very, very important because it gives a sensation to the ear lobule. So the first thing when I do after raising the skin incision is try to identify the greater auricular nerve. It divides into an anterior branch and a posterior branch. The posterior branch I tend to preserve very meticulously. I lift the tail. I see the super. Uh, I see the posterior belly of the digastric, and I directly go to the tragal cartilage. And just below the tragal cartilage, uh, I would find about a, 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 about a centimeter below and medial. I would find the nerve. So that's exactly the way, and and I I don't really go about uh, searching for the nerve. I, what I find is that you know invariably if you go in that plane, almost I I would say in almost hundred percent of the cases you would sort of get the nerve, unless of course the tumor is actually very on the tragal cartilage nerve point. If the tumor is on the ca tragal cartilage nerve point, then it becomes slightly difficult. You use various other mechanisms, but these in short these are the mechanisms I tend to use. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Have you ever done a retrograde trace, uh, tracing of the facial nerve? Uh, in in some cases. In your experience, in your experience. Uh, no, by and large, I think some of the branch, some of the branches, we have tended to trace it that way, and this has especially happened in cases. It's not for the facial trunk, but sometimes what happens is because of a lot of fibrosis. What happens is some of the branches get entangled, and there is not much thing. So what I tend to do is I follow this branch and try to also try to see the distal. So it's exactly not a retrograde approach, but uh, but it's it, most of the times it's it's been an anti-grade approach. In fact, I've been very very comfortable identifying the facial trunk and uh, going there. Retrograde is something that they have described in textbooks only for recurrent surgeries, and uh, I've sort of you know as I said I use very selectively for certain nerve branches because it's very important not just to identify the trunk but all of us know it's very important to preserve all the five branches so some in some branches if there is a difficulty i tend to use the combined approach of uh, retrograde and the anterograde approach but definitely not for identifying the main trunk any recent advances in the parotid fistula sir management of parotid fistula parotid fistulas is by is a very uh, no it it, it is In a very it's an advanced one uh, not much sir i think it's it's the prevention i think whenever whenever we tend to and that is again uh, all these uh, things of salivary fistulas tend to happen when we do lesser surgeries supposing if we do a superficial parotidectomy and you ligate the that uh, the duct then almost never we sort of have a parotid fistula it is only inadvert inadvertently because we tend to do lesser surgery and what happens is you tend to sort of you know leave a lot of parotid gland tissue all around then sometimes the issue of uh, uh, some parotid uh, leaks or parotid fistulas uh, tend to happen so the so that's another advantage of doing a superficial parotid means you hardly ever will ever have a parotid fistula Sorry for troubling with so many questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> my, my, my pleasure, sir. I'm happy that you know senior people. In fact, that's the beauty of this platform. I think you just don't yes. have just the trainees, but uh, you have super Thanks. seniors, and they are there to guide you and you know sort of you know see that you know you you are doing the right balance uh, balance. No, post postgraduate, anything can be asked, but not everything can be asked. So that's what I ask, sir. That's right. Uh, thank, thank you, the Professor Radha Thank you, sir. Any, thank you, sir. any anyone you. else uh, for uh, uh, question or two to Doctor? Um, Arvind, anybody? Good evening, Professor Ishwar sir. Yes, sir. So, if no questions, thank you so much, Dr. Arvind, for a nice session, thank interactive you, sir. session, you. and we'll see you again next week. Thank sure, you. Sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you again once again for the opportunity.